Welcome. <clears throat> My name is Hillel Neuer. I'm the Executive Director of United Nations Watch. I'll be chairing today's side event on the subject of protection of detainees in the context of armed conflict. Um, I'll just go through the program briefly of the speakers. We're going to hear from Jenny Savidia, who's here next to me. We'll give the context of armed conflict as someone who was a victim uh, at the uh, music festival uh, of the uh, atrocities that happened on October 7th. So that will give us the context of armed conflict. We'll then hear from family members and former hostages themselves. Uh, they'll be speaking to us by video. Uh, we'll hear from Sapir Cohen, Sharon Aloni Cunio, Moshe Lavi, and Hila Rotem Shoshani. We'll then hear from two experts on our panel. One is Anne Hertzberg. She's the legal counsel with uh, NGO Monitor and is an expert in international law and human rights and has written about the subjects of today's topic. We'll also hear from Andre Last, who's visiting from Brazil. He took the floor uh, in today's debate, and he'll be sharing uh, his statements as well. Finally, we'll hear from Ayelet Samarano, her 21-year-old son, Jonathan, um, his lifeless body was kidnapped by an UNRWA social worker. Um, uh, and we'll hear from her. She spoke in Geneva recently. And then we'll hear from uh, attorney Mark Goldfeder about uh, legal remedies. Uh, so that's our program. I'll just say a few words of introduction of where we are here uh, in terms of the program at the Human Rights Council. We just concluded, concluded item seven general debate, which deals with um, the situation in Israel and Palestine. Um, we heard yesterday from the special rapporteur uh, on Palestinian human rights, Francesca Albanese. She delivered a 25-page report uh, uh, entitled The Anatomy of Genocide, in which she accuses Israel of genocide. Uh, as I said when I took the floor yesterday in the interactive dialogue, um, she indicates at the beginning of her report, at paragraph two, that she is not going to be examining in her report the crimes of October 7th um, because she says it's outside the geographic scope of her mandate. I don't know what that means. Um, uh, the terrorists came from Gaza. They took the hostages back to Gaza. Um, uh, of course, uh, there's nothing in, the, in her mandate that prevents her from addressing these uh, uh, the crimes of October 7th. I asked her about it, um, and she declined to answer. Um, I noted that, that she recently took a, an official trip to Australia where she gave lectures and media interviews, and somehow a visit to Australia was, was somehow within the geographic scope of her mandate, but not examining um, gross uh, and systematic uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity uh, in Gaza and in Israel. So we didn't get an answer on that. Uh, it's unfortunate that she didn't address what happened. It's, it's, un, it's unclear how you can talk about a war and qualify it as genocide if you don't examine what happened in the war. And that's what we'll do today. We'll hear in a moment from a speaker who will tell you exactly how the war began. Uh, you'll have uh, eyewitness testimony. Um, and I'll just say that from uh, Francesca Albanese, although she concluded, she said it met a threshold of genocide, the truth is that she's been making these claims for over a decade. So it's not new, and she wasn't waiting for any threshold. You can go back to um, July 25th, 2014, when she tweeted out uh, incremental genocide. She accused Israel of incremental genocide 10 years ago. So she's been making these accusations against Israel for 10 years. That was the same month where she uh, said that America is controlled by the Jewish lobby. So in, in July 2014, she wrote a letter to her, um, the head of her uh, Catholic diocese in Italy, urging him to raise money for UNRWA. She used to work for UNRWA. And she wrote a long speech on how he should raise money for UNRWA. And she said, one of the problems is that America is subjugated by the Jewish lobby. So uh, that's the context of Francesca Albanese. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, she was condemned by both France and Germany. It's the first time in the history of the United Nations that I'm aware of that a UN Human Rights Council special rapporteur was condemned by France and Germany for anti-Semitism. Um, as you know, I mentioned that she denied that the massacre was, um, was an anti-Semitic act. Um, she said it had nothing to do with, uh, with, with anti-Semitism. Um, she criticized President Macron 
for, for saying that it was. He, he said that it was uh, the greatest anti-Semitic massacre of our century since the Holocaust. And she said it was all done in reaction to Israel's oppression. France said that the October 7th massacre replied to her was, was the biggest anti-Semitic massacre of the 21st century, and to deny it is wrong. I'll read it in French and I'll translate it. They, France said, um, <clears throat> Le massacre de 7 octobre, this is a tweet that the French foreign ministry wrote to um, uh, Francesca Albanese, the UN rapporteur. Le massacre de 7 octobre est le plus grand massacre antisémite du XXIe siècle. Le contester est un faux. Semble le justifier en y mêlant le nom des Nations Unies est une honte. Ces propos sont d'autant plus scandaleux que la lutte contre l'antisémitisme et toutes les formes de racisme sont au cœur de la fondation de l'ONU. So, to translate, uh, the French Foreign Ministry told her on Twitter, the October 7th massacre is the largest anti-Semitic massacre of the 21st century. Challenging it, denying it is a, is a terrible thing. Seeming to justify it by including the name of the United Nations is a disgrace. These comments are all the more scandalous since the fight against anti-Semitism and all forms of racism are at the heart of the founding of the United Nations. So this is the French foreign ministry. Again, uh, I've been here for only 20 years, um, but in, in, to the best of my knowledge, no UN Human Rights Council special rapporteur has ever been condemned by the French government uh, or the German government because Germany also intervened. Uh, Germany issued a statement uh, on February 11th and said the following to, this is a tweet to uh, Francesca Venezia, to justify the horrific terror attacks of October 11th and deny their anti-Semitic nature is appalling. Making such statements in a UN capacity is a disgrace and goes against everything the United Nations stands for. So we're at a very um, low point here at the United Nations where a rapporteur has been condemned for the first time by the governments of France and Germany, which are some of the leading supporters of the UN Human Rights Special Procedures. And of course, when she was appointed two years ago, we went to the council and we informed them that uh, based on the UN's own rules, which require um, uh, mandate holders to be impartial, objective, and, and credible, um, she is someone who has equated the Palestinian experience in 1948 and 49 with the Nazi Holocaust. She accused Israel routinely of apartheid, genocide, ethnic cleansing, and war crimes. So she was really the last person who would be considered objective. Indeed, in an interview, um, she herself said that she was not objective. So uh, that's what happened yesterday, and I think it's therefore all the more important that when we have this whole debate for several hours on a report of 25 pages that refuses to examine what happened on October 7th, that we hear from victims uh, of, of the massacre and also of uh, the current hostages. With that, I give the floor to Jenny Savidia, who is very courageous for coming here, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I have about five minutes to tell my story. When it will, in real times, in reality, it happened, it continued more than 10 hours. Uh, so anything I'm going to say now, believe me, it was much, much horrified. Um, so when Hamas started bombing central and south, southern and central Israel at around 6.30 a.m., um, my brother, who was with me at the festival with his girlfriend and my partner, so my brother and his girlfriend decided to go back home. They were anxious to go back to their children. They lived in bomb cities, and they were afraid. So they rushed to get out. They encountered the terrorists on their way out. They ran away for about an hour and a half till the terrorists got to them and butchered them. Uh, we, the family, got the notice a week after October 7th that my brother's body was identified. We were advised not to see the body. So till this day, we have no idea how it happened or where the body was found. We just know he's not alive. As for me and my partner, Noam, at first, we waited at the festival premises. Uh, we thought that was a safe place. Uh, shortly after my brother uh, left, 
um, the terrorists entered the festival, started shooting everybody with all kinds of ammunition, not only bullets, also RPGs and grenades. At first, me and Noam decided to leave, to run away with our car. Uh, we had no idea what was happening outside of the festival. Uh, we took 13 more people with us inside our small car, hoped to go to a safe place, to drive to a safe place, when actually everywhere we went, we saw terrorists. There was no safe place. At some point, we had to leave our car and run by foot. The car that was before us, all those that were inside the car got shot by the terrorist. We started running by foot, dodging bullets, missiles, grenades. An RPG missile fell right next to me, um, missing me like a few centimeters. Um, at some point, we got to a bush. We decided to hide inside a bush, which was not no bulletproof, believe me. We heard all the atrocities that Hamas committed, people yelling, screaming for their life. We hid inside the bush for a few minutes until we heard somebody screaming, this is not a safe place, the terrorists are here, please, all those who are here, run to the other, other direction. So that's what we did. But then I found out that the terrorist threw a grenade towards the bush we were at, and those who weren't fast enough to get up got killed. So we ran to the other direction. Again, dodging bullets, grenades, RPGs, missiles, skipping hundreds of bodies, till we got to an orchard, and we decided to get inside and uh, hide inside one of the trees. Um, as um, we, are, we were not the only one, a lot of people that were there decided to do the same. Uh, the terrorists saw, saw everybody getting inside the orchard, so they entered the orchard and started shooting the trees and the people that hid inside of the trees. Um, they passed right next to my tree and missed us. Uh, and we sat there for about six hours, hiding, um, hearing um, the atrocities that Hamas committed <clears throat> along the main road and inside the orchard. At some point, Hamas burned the orchard, <clears throat> so we had no, uh, no other way, no, we, had, we had no other possibility but to get out, out of the tree. Unfortunately, we were lucky enough to find a force of police, women and men, Israeli police, Israeli force. And those policemen and women got us out of the battlefield, not to a safe place, but a safer place, uh, which was a police station in uh, a city named Ofakim, which was under attack when we got there. It was still under attack, but the police station was clear from the terrorists, so we waited there. And on the way to Afakim, we saw sights that was beyond any imagination. Burned bodies, bodies all over the place, burned bodies, <coughs> bodies leaning from their cars, burned cars soldiers, policemen, it was a battlefield. When we got to Ofakim, I started to look for Shlomi and Lily. I, Lily was Shlomi's girlfriend. I had no idea what happened to him. For me, the worst case scenario was that he is wounded somewhere and we need to take him to the hospital. And I refused to leave the police station. I felt like I'm abandoning my brother until some point a policeman came to me and told me, listen, you can't stay here. You must leave. This is not safe. 
it's not safe to be here. So although my heart told me I should stay, my mind told me I should leave. So that's what I did. I went back to my parents' house, which they had no idea we were at the festival. They heard it for the first time on uh, October 7th evening, on, on that evening. And then we started to look for Shlomi and, you know, all you know, uh, the end. So, um, that's it. We say in Israel, in Hebrew, en milim, there are no words. So, uh, en milim. Uh, can only thank you for coming here. Uh, it's very important to tell your story. As you said at the United Nations, you are real. Yeah. And the story is real because uh, things are so upside down in today's world that uh, there are many in the world who, who just refuse to uh, admit reality. We had Holocaust deniers, and, and now we have in our time October 7th deniers. And so um, uh, hopefully uh, some people in the world will understand what happened. Um, with that, we're going to go to hear testimony of family members of hostages and former hostages themselves uh, on video. Our next speaker is Sapir Cohen. She was kidnapped with her boyfriend from Kibbutz Neil Oz on October 7th. About two months later, she was released, but her boyfriend continues to remain a hostage. Hey, I'm Sapir Cohen, about 29. Uh, הייתי בשבי 55 ימים, השתחררתי בפעימה האחרונה. אני רוצה לפנות לסשה, הבן זוג היקר שלי. יש לו לב זהב. אני כל כך מחכה לו שיחזור כבר. אני כל כך פוחדת ממה שהוא עובר שם, כי כל הגברים החזקים, אלה הגברים החלשים שם. אלה האנשים שעוברים הכי הרבה איסורים. כל יום יכול להיות שאנחנו מאבדים. עוד ועוד חטופים, כי הם לא יכולים להישאר בתנאים האלה, הם פשוט לא יכולים להמשיך לחיות ככה, וצריך להחזיר אותם הביתה עכשיו. Our next speaker is Sharon Aloni Cunio. She was kidnapped with her husband and three-year-old twins, Emma and Yuli, from Kibbutz Nir Oz. On October 7th, she was taken, separated from her family. She feared the worst. Uh, miraculously, as Hamas was moving the family between different Homes in Gaza, they ended up in the same hospital in Khan Yunus and were able to find each other. On November 27th, Sharon and her twins were released by Hamas, but her husband, David, still remained a hostage. What do you do every day? I'm in this situation only in this situation. I'm already thinking about Emma, about Emma, about Emilia, and Emilia. אני אומרת לעצמי, זהו, אנחנו... נגמרו החיים, אנחנו פה. האישה עכשיו ילדה לטפל בה, נכון? וזה נע בין רגע שצריך כל הזמן למצוא לה תעסוקה, לבין לשמור עליה בשקט, כל הזמן ששש, עוסקות עוסקות. כל הזמן אומרים לנו שקט. כי אסור שישמעו, כי אומרים כל הזמן שיש מזל"טים מעל. זה מטריף, העוסקות הזה שאנחנו שומעים עכשיו מכל מי שחזר משם. כן. סיפרו חלק מהחטופים שהיה רדיו. לא, אצלנו לא היה רדיו, לא טלוויזיה. אז לא היה לך שום מידע, שום מידע. לא על המשפחה שלך, ובעיקר לא על אמה. לא. ואז יום אחד, אמה חוזרת. ואז יום אחד אה, אנחנו מופגזים, והבית, אה, זה כמו דופלקס כזה, הבית הצמוד אה, מופגז, ו... חצי קיר, חלונות, הכל נשבר עלינו, והם מבינים שצריך להבריח אותנו משם. אנחנו בלחץ, רועדים, משקשקים, והכל זכוכיות, ונכנסו לזכוכיות לראש. העבירו אותנו דרך אמבולנס, כשדוד מוסווה כגופה, ואני לובשת את הבגדים המסורתיים, ויהיו לי בידיים שלי מוסתרת עם סדין, ואנחנו מסתכלים למטה. לוקחים אותנו לתוך אמבולנס. ומגיעים לאותו בית חולים, ששם היינו עד הסוף. אנחנו בתוך חדר שם, ולמחרת, זה היה באמצע הלילה, סביב הצהריים הם אומרים לנו שרוצים לעשות סיור.
סרטון לאלג'זירה, על הבכירים, לא יודעת למי. ואומרים לי, שימי את ה... תרימי את הכיסוי ראש. דוד מחזיק את יולי, נכנסים איזה ארבעה, אחד מהם עם מצלמה. ואני אומרת לו, פתאום שומעים בכי. ואני ככה תופסת את דוד ואני אומרת לו, זה הבכי של אמה. הוא אומר לי, כאילו, מה אמה? איפה אנחנו, איפה אמה? כאילו, מה הקשר פה? והבכי מתחזק ונכנס לחדר. ואת רואה את אמה מולך? נכנס רופא, שמח... אח, רופא, לא יודעת מה הוא היה, שמחזיק את אמה ומוסר לי אותה כמו חבילה. כשהיא כולה בהיסטריה, היא לא נרגעת אפילו כשהיא אצלי בידיים. תמיד אני שרה לה, היא מטרד אלינו אווירון בבית כשהן בוכות. אני רואה שהיא בהיסטריה והיסטריה, והתחלתי לשיר לה את זה, ולאט לאט היא התחילה להירגע. הם אומרים לנו, תגידו, תגידו תודה במצלמה שהחזרנו את הבת שלכם. אחי ש... סוריאליסטי זה מילה קטנה מדי בשביל זה. ומאותו רגע התאחדנו. עד הרגע שהפרידו את דוד כמה ימים לפני השחרור שלנו. היה לך מאוד לא פשוט להיפרד ממנו. נכון. זה היה רגע שהם קראו לו החוצה. אמרו לו שאיזה בכיר רוצה לדבר איתו. הייתה לנו הרגשה כבר לא טובה. כי דוד כל הזמן אמר מההתחלה, תראי שהם יפרידו את הגברים בסוף. ואז uh, הוא שואל את אחד השובים שלנו, אלה שהיו יותר ב... ביום יום, בשוטף, אומר לו, אני חוזר? אומר לו, לא. לוקחים אותך למקום עם גברים, כי ישראל החליטה שנשים וילדים חוזרים. ואז, פשוט שלוש שעות של בכי, והבנות בוכות, כי אבא הולך. שלוש שעות שאני נתלית לו פשוט, מתחבקים, בוכים, הוא אומר לי, תהיי חזקה בשביל הבנות, ואני אומרת לו, לא, אני רוצה להישאר איתך. אמרתי לו, המשפחות שלנו בארץ, אין לי בכלל ספק שידאגו הכי טוב שאפשר לאמה ויולי, אם יהיו בידיים בטוחות. באמת התכוונת לזה? תראי, אני רציתי שהילדות שלי יצאו מעזה, אבל אני גם רציתי להיות בשביל בעלי, שאני רואה ש... איך הוא אמר את זה? אני מת מפחד. הדילמה הזאת שלי קרה בין להיות עם הילדות שלך ולחזור לארץ ולהיות ההורה היחיד בשבילם. כדי להשאיר את... להשאיר את בעלך לבדו. אלוהים יודע איפה ובאיזה תנאים. דילמה שאף אחד לא צריך לעבור. ובסוף השתחררתי איתם. ודוד, <laughs> אלוהים יודע איפה עכשיו ובאיזה תנאים. ואני מתה מפחד כל יום שהוא לא יהיה הסרטון האכזרי הבא שהם מוציאים. החיים מבחינתי נעצרו ב-24, זה היה היום הראשון של השחרורים, זה היה היום שלקחו אותו ממני. ושם אני תקועה על זה, לא מסוגלת להמשיך, בוכה כל היום, שוקעת כל היום. ואת אומרת לעצמך, מה עשינו רע שזה מגיע לנו? למה הילדות שלי בנות שלוש צריכות לשאול יום יום איפה אבא? למה אבא לא עושה לנו את הטיול לילה באור? למה אבא לא מקלח אותנו? למה אבא לא איתנו? אני צריכה להגיד להם, לעבוד בעזה. למה הם לא מחזירים אותו? אין לי תשובה לשאלות האלה. אין. בגלל זה אני אומרת, כל יום שם הוא קריטי. התנאים שם נהיים רק יותר ויותר קשים. עד כמה הוא חזק? עד כמה הוא היה יכול להחזיק עוד מעמד? הוא כבר היה שבר כלי שם. דוד הוא גבר מאוד מאוד חזק, אבל... הסיטואציה שהעמידו אותנו בה, סליחה רגע, הסיטואציה שהעמידו אותנו שם זה את כל החטופים. זה לא דבר שאת מורגלת אליו, זה לא דבר שמכינים אותך באיזושהי צורה. אנחנו סך הכל משפחה מקיבוץ קטן בעוטף עזה שעד השביעי לעשירי, אף אחד בכלל לא הכיר את השם שלו. מה לנו ולדבר הזה? Thanks so much, Hillel, and thank you to UN Watch for having me. Um, I'm an Israeli, so as an Israeli, obviously, I feel very strongly about these events. 
Um, personally, I am also I also know uh, very well one of the hostages, Hirsch Goldberg Polin, uh, who was kidnapped from the Nova Festival, is the son of good my good friends Rachel and John. Um, I've known her since he was nine years old, ten years old. I was at his bar mitzvah. Uh, he was the last person I said goodbye to at synagogue on October 6th. Him and his parents were the last people I said goodbye to. Um, so obviously this is very um, uh, hard for me as well, um, you know, and just thinking about them. And um, also uh, the boy that he was with, Anir Shapira, I'm also friends with his parents as well. So this is something that has affected every person in Israel. Um, people don't understand what a small country it is. Every single person in Israel knows somebody who has been impacted horribly by the events of October 7th. Um, but putting on my lawyer hat and my NGO monitor hat, um, we need to talk about the international community's reaction to the hostages because especially as of late, they are really an afterthought. I sat through the debate yesterday with Francesca Albanese, also the item two debate on accountability that occurred earlier in the session, and as well as the item seven debate, and you heard little to nothing about the hostages. Uh, the crime of taking hostages is a grave international crime. Um, it is a Jus Kogan's norm, meaning it is one of the highest uh, levels of crime. It is prohibited in both treaty law and customary international law. It is described as a grave breach in the Geneva Conventions and the Protocols. There is a international convention, the 1979 Convention Against the Taking of Hostages. And these are all very strong legal prohibitions that we did not hear one word about in these debates. Um, the rights of the hostages languishing, being tortured, sexually assaulted every day in Gaza is completely absent from the discussion. Um, it is solely, what I heard today and yesterday was atrocious, solely focused on Israel, um, libel, libelous claims of genocide, forced starvation, and yet we hear nothing about these people, these 135 people that we know are still in Gaza, what is happening to them, their rights being violated 24-7. Um, this is not a subject of debate and it's a disgrace. And actually, I do want to call out, I have been attending some of the many side events that we've been having in this building of all the various Palestinian NGOs where the rapporteurs come, and the room is full of people, full of representatives from European countries, and I don't see any representative of a European country in this room right now, and I also find that disgraceful. Where is the international community advocating for the rights, the human rights, the legal rights of the hostages in Gaza? So th this is a shame on everybody. Um, and as those of us who do care, who did take the time to come and listen to the side event today, to hear the testimonies of people who have suffered from October 7th, um, I would hope that you could serve as advocates um, also on their behalf. Now briefly, I also just want to mention um, the issue of Al-Shifa Hospital, because that's something that's been a, a, a debate in the news. Um, Hamas, as we know, has taken over the hospital. Um, there, we, there have been reports that they were doing this for years. Um, when I started writing, I wrote, I wrote an article in Fathom Journal about the taking of hostages uh, that I published last month, which you can find online. Uh, but I originally began to write about that story in November when we saw in the news CCT footage of hostages on the morning of October 7th being brought into Al-Shifa Hospital and being surrounded by medical workers and scurried off most likely into a terror bunker. We don't know what happened to them. And then later when uh, some of the hostages, thank God, were released, and even in the past few days, many of them have been testifying how they were held in Gaza's hospitals. And this is also another atrocity. Every hospital in Gaza is closely um, operated by the international community, by UN agencies, by the ICRC, and by humanitarian aid organizations. And you cannot tell me that no one in these organizations knew what was going on with these terrorist organizations taking over these hospitals in Gaza, and how many of those people saw hostages being brought into their hospitals 
over the past few months and have said and done nothing about it. It is, and, and this is really something that, this is a in, more indicative problem of the humanitarian aid system in Gaza. This has been going on for 17 years where Hamas has been allowed to steal aid, divert it to its terror campaign. And there's been what I've been calling an omerta from the international community refusing to speak about this. Even today, we heard nothing about that. We heard about Israel, uh, forced starvation, uh, not providing enough humanitarian aid, and we heard not a word about diversion of this aid. And so these issues are inextricably linked with the hostage issue, and we must continue to advocate on their behalf, but also for a complete overhaul of the humanitarian aid system in Gaza. It cannot continue the way it's been going on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Uh, we're going to try again with our video. Hopefully the logistics will work. Last month, just over 150 days since the October 7th Hamas massacre, the National Jewish Advocacy Center, working with attorneys from Finger and Slanina, the law office of David I. Schoen, Goldfeder and Terry, the International Legal Forum, and Holtzman Vogel, filed a federal complaint in Delaware against UNRWA USA on behalf of a group of survivors of the terrorist attack, as well as family members of those who unfortunately did not survive, displaced families, and the family members of a current hostage. UNRWA USA is a 501c3 charity that supports the work of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine through fundraising, education, and advocacy in the United States. It is the largest private donor to UNRWA. And our lawsuit describes how UNRWA USA materially supported terrorism by knowingly, actively, and systematically using their charity to operate a terrorist financing scheme in violation of federal law. It follows explosive evidence, much of it put forth by the incredible team at UN Watch, of UNRWA staff participating in the murder and abductions of Israelis and Americans, as well as allowing their facilities to be used for Hamas control and command centers. UNRWA has become an inseparable arm of Hamas and a systematic incubator of hate, incitement, and terror. We are not talking about a few rotten apples. The entire organization is rotten to the core and infested with terror. As their primary non-governmental fundraising platform in the U.S., UNRWA USA must be held accountable for helping to underwrite the mass slaughter rape, and abductions by Hamas on October 7th. Unfortunately, UNRWA has been granted immunity, and so it acts with impunity. This case is vitally important in the effort to bring some measure of justice to these victims by cutting off at least one source of funding. The underwriting of terrorism by NGOs under the guise of philanthropy and altruism is a particularly pernicious form of material support. UNRWA USA and the world at large have long known of the significant intersection between UNRWA and Hamas, and the willful denial of those relationships is not a shield from liability under our anti-terrorism statutes. The simple truth is this. Charities generally do good work, which is why they often fly under the radar. But on some very rare occasions, a so-called charity is really a front to help finance an international terrorist plot that kills thousands of innocent people. This case involves one of those rare occasions, and that so-called charity, UNRWA USA, must be held accountable. God willing, they will be. Our next speaker is Moshe Lavi. His brother-in-law, Omri Miran, was kidnapped from his home in Kibbutz near Oz. The family to this day has heard nothing about him and his status. Tell me about Omri. Omri is a 46 years old man. is an incredible father to my two nieces, Ronnie and Alma, who are two and a half years old and nine, nine months old. Um, is an uh, amazing husband to my sister Lisha. is a family man connected to us uh, since he came into our family and of course to his, 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 his father and his siblings. His mother sadly passed away a few years ago. Uh, my mom received a message that Lishai, my sister survived, that the two uh, babies survived. 
but that Omri was taken hostage. Um, I'm grateful my parents uh, were rescued and survived, and my, my, both my sisters survived, but Omri was taken. And, and during that, those 10 hours, we learned that Hamas terrorists barge into their home. They used a teenage boy from the kibbutz, their neighbor, Tomer, a 15-year-old teenager, to lure them to open the door. So they, of course, opened the door to save his life. Later on that day, Hamas murdered Tomer um, and most of his family. Uh, for hours, they were abused at, his, at their home, um, held at gunpoint. Their house was ransacked, ravaged. They were later grouped with another family, the Dan family, whose daughter, Mayan, was murdered, 18 years old, in front of her uh, siblings, in front of her parents. Held hostage there for hours. Um, it was live stream on Facebook, all this ordeal. They took a, f a phone from... Uh, the terrorists live streamed this. Yeah, they took the phone of one of the family members of the Dan family and live streamed this entire ordeal. We found out later. We have the footage. Have you uh, seen that footage? I I've seen it. Um, it's... Uh, it's. I, I, I don't think anybody can imagine what we feel when we see it. You, you see my sister holding Alma, my, my young, youngest niece, as gun, gunshots are heard in the background, as rockets are heard uh, in the background, people screaming. They're sitting on the floor, held hostage at gunpoint. It, it's terrible. At some point, Omri was told to get up alongside uh, three others, um, and he was handcuffed and taken to Gaza as a hostage. My sister told him she loves him, she'll take care of the girls, and ask him not to be a hero because they're waiting for him to return safely home. And that was the last time she saw him. She was instructed to stay put or else she'll be killed uh, for hours more. And um, for hours more, she witnessed what's going on in the kibbutz uh, as it was burning, as people were screaming and shouting um, for their lives. But luckily, she was rescued by the IDF at 5.30 p.m. that day, 11 hours after the invasion started. We're grateful for that so much. She was rescued with a few others in the kibbutz. But uh, Omriz is a hostage, and so... We haven't started the healing process, of course, and we're focusing, laser focused on, on bringing Omri home. Do you have any idea his whereabouts, his condition? Has there been any contact or information on him since October 7th? Hamas, uh, sadly, does not allow um, the, the hostages to be visited by the ICSC or any other international organization. They don't provide any proof of life. We have no credible uh, sources to uh, ensure that they provide him uh, efficient medical care either. We do know Omri was alive about 10 weeks ago because in the f previous round of uh, release of hostages as a result of the negotiated agreement, um, some of the hostages were released in November, reported that Omri was alive, that he was in an okay condition, uh, and that, is, is, um, that he learned in captivity that Lishai, my sister, and his two daughters survived. That gave them strength, and he projected strength to others who were held captive with him. But it's been so long since then, and we don't have any proof of life. We don't know his condition. We don't know his whereabouts. Our next speaker is Hila Roteb Shoshani, a 13-year-old girl from Kibbutz Be'eri. She was kidnapped and held hostage in Gaza for nearly two months. <laughs> אני ואמילי קמנו בשש בבוקר, ואימא, ורצנו לממ"ד, והיה טילים, ואזעקות, ואז אנחנו שומעים דיבורים בערבית, ואז הם פשוט פותחים את הדלת, ונכנסים עם אקדחים וסכינים, ואז הם לקחו אותנו עד לגדר. בתים שרופים וגופות, וכאילו אפילו אף חיילים לא ראינו. ואז העלו אותנו על אוטו, ו... והתחלנו לנסוע. את האמת חשבתי שיש יותר כאילו שכל הקיבוץ או משהו, או חטוף או נהרג, כאילו. לא חשבתי שכאילו הרבה, כמו שאני רואה עכשיו, הצליחו לי להינצל. מזל שהיה לי את אמילי, דיברנו בלחישות קצת, אבל אין אוכל ואין מים, והיינו בחושך, בלי אור יום. אם היינו מדברים בקול חזק, 
אז הם היו לוקחים אותנו מהחדר שהיינו בו בתור עונש. כן, לבד, הם לקחו אותי מכולם. ויש הרבה פחדים. אני כל הזמן נזכרת, אני לא יכולה לא לחשוב על זה. זה כיף לחזור כאילו למקום שוב. סוף סוף אני יודעת שאני בטוחה פה. יש לי עדיין פחדים שיגיעו גם לפה, אבל אני יודעת שאני בטוחה כאילו. נורא שכל רגע הם, החיים שלהם בסכנה, וזה... אני כאילו בסוף לא אשאר את מי להציל משם יותר. צריך להחזיר את כה המאה. Uh, our next speaker is Ayelet Samirano. She uh, addressed our summit uh, here in Geneva a few weeks ago on a future beyond UNRWA, and you'll see uh, what she had to say. Good noon, everyone. Last week, uh, the Kidnapped Families Forum held a press conference, and the world heard my cry, a mother's cry. I would like to tell you a little bit about Yonatan. I will tell you about the core values as a 21 years old and the way he was raised. The young people that go to, do, to these parties, the Nova Party, believe in freedom, in democracy, in acceptance, in accepting every one of us as equal. Jonathan and his friend believe in acceptance and care for our world, for the earth and for all human beings and animals. My young son's generation don't care about religion. They don't care about sexual orientation. They don't care about race. They just want to live peaceful and happy life. My son was not armed. He was not in a war situation. His only weapon were his smile, as you saw, happiness and charm. Jonathan was full of life. Always smiling, always joking. He did everything with joy and people always wanted to be he near him, to be his friends. Jonathan's entire existence was full of life. Even now, we cannot think about him in relation to tragedy and murder. Jonathan is the life, and the life is Jonathan. You are asking me why UNRWA needs to be replaced. An UNRWA's worker kidnapped my son.
we're seeing here an UNRWA social worker kidnapping the body of Yonatan Samarano. Uh, his, his identity was verified in the Washington Post article. A social worker for a so-called humanitarian organization kidnapped my son. How can someone working for an organization that claims to do good in this world do something so cruel and unhuman? How can the UN pay this man who dragged my son's limp body on the ground and then picked him up if he was a prize into Gaza. How many more lives have been ruined by this person holding my son like he is even a human being into a UNRWA car? Are, they, are there any other hostages held by UN employees, even as we are talking right now? Does the UN hold my son? Do you know where he is? Bring him back to me. Mr. Guterres. Look at my eyes and answer me. Answer me now. Where is my son? You are next door. You're here. And you have the opportunity to meet me today and tell me, what are you going to do? And how can you bring me back my son. I'm not an invest investigator and cannot answer those questions. I am just a mother who lost the most precious thing in the world. That is why I am standing here before you today and demanding answers about my sons. We're going to stop it there. We want to hear from our last speaker, Andre Last, who's come with us, who's come here from Stand With Us Brazil to give concluding remarks. Uh, I, I wanted to, to bring a perspective of education that Stand With Us works a lot in, uh, in Latin America about what happened in the 7th of October that people normally uh, try to, as you said, they are Holocaust deniers, now they are 7th of October deniers. And... Uh, I think that many people in the UN and in the national community need to understand about the gra gravity of what happened, not of specific the numbers, but the attitude, the concept of this attack by kidnapping 200, more than 200 people, civilians mainly, babies, women, elderly, and, and, and hoping that this will bring some resolution that will help the Palestinian cause. And I see that in the same time, not just here in this body, but in Brazil, politicians around South America for political gain, they try to, they try to portray the situation in which that the 7th October didn't happen in the vacuum, that was a past history that needed to be resolved. Well, Israel did try to resolve many, many times since the 30s to establish a resolution in order to help peace and security for the region. And it didn't help. And it didn't help not because Israel didn't offer, but because the other side most of the times rejected the offer that they, were, that they have been offered. So, and then this attack happened. And, and, and I think, 
And I think that mostly, if I want to leave you with a message, is a message of education. The only solution for the region is education for life. If education for death, for fight, for terror, for kidnapping, if people are being praised by being a member of terrorist groups, if people are being paid by governments like the PA, the Palestinian Authority pay for, for, for people that committed terrorist attacks uh, uh, against Jews and Israelis at all, uh, and if being, people are being, in the end of the day, reward by the crimes they commit, they will continue to commit those crimes against Israelis and against Palestinians uh, uh, itself. In the end of the day, we don't going to see peace and we don't going to see a solution if we don't have a proper education in the Gaza Strip and in the Palestinian Authority in order to achieve that peace. We need to have uh, an effort of every single member of this body and trying to understand that the attack that happened in Israel wasn't an attack just on the Jews and not just to the Israelis, but it's an attack against liberty, against democracy. And I have bad news. If Israel don't succeed against Hamas, Europe is next. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes our session. Thank you all for participating.